Welcome to part six of our seven part series titled Seven Eye Opening Examples. Following are seven examples of Elohim opening people's eyes. In every case, the eye opening resulted in belief and obedience. It's important to believe when Yeshua is presented to us, it's important to believe that He is the one and only Son of God. He is the one and only way to salvation. He is the one and only way to eternal life. It's important to believe that when He is presented to us. But it's also important to obey Yeshua to look in the scripture and see what he says and to see what is said about him and then to obey what he says. Obey what other people said that he said. As opposed to making up our own ideas. We are told that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. People can say all they want. Oh, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. That's the right spirit. We should love the Lord. But love has a definition. Love is defined as the keeping of God's commandments. Which commandments? The Ten Commandments. In the letter and spirit of the law. And we're going to see that today. That the Ten Commandments, they are still in effect. God wants to write His laws in our hearts and in our mind. No longer on two tables of stone, but now on two tables of the heart and the mind. So we can say we love the Lord. That's the right spirit. But we also have to obey the Lord. And what is obedience comprised of? It is comprised of keeping the Ten Commandments in the letter and spirit of the law. That is the definition of love. The first four commandments teach us to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul. And the last six commandments teach us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So there is a definition to love. There is a definition to obedience. And that's what's at the heart of God's law is obedience to, and that is, if, when we obey, that is a demonstration of love. So we already covered two people on the road to Emmaus, God opening up their eyes to see Yeshua as their Savior and their Lord, again believing that He's the one who saves us from our, <coughs> excuse me, from our sins, but He's also our Lord, the one who leads us into obedience. So we saw our Father opening up eyes of two people on the road to Emmaus. We also saw God the Father opening up eyes to see Yeshua, and this was directed toward the eleven disciples and others. And both of these situations, it was after the resurrection of Yeshua, which happened on the Saturday evening. And then these first two events happened on a Sunday, the first Sunday after he had been resurrected. And then 50 days later, you have... Israelites on the day of Pentecost, where there was about 3,000 who had their eyes open, and in the next 20 years, there could have been 10, 20, 30, 40,000 eyes open, and this would be specifically physical Israelites who had their eyes open. Then we saw at about 50 AD, so we had 30 AD is when uh, Passover was, when Yeshua was crucified, he was resurrected. Uh, after three days and three nights in the grave, and on Sunday of 30 AD, after the resurrection, we have the example of the two people on the road to Emmaus and the eleven disciples and others having their eyes open. And then 50 days later, still in 30 AD, you would have the Israelites on the day of Pentecost. And then about 20 years later, in 50 AD, you had Paul turning to the Gentiles preaching to the Gentiles. 
And we also looked at Lydia, that was our fifth example. And today we're going to be looking at Israelites on the Day of Trumpets. Now this is a future Day of Trumpets that we're talking about. And then, God willing, we have two more programs. All people previously blinded. That one is separated into two programs because we're going to go quite in depth into that. And it requires two programs. So let's get into Israelites <laughs> on the day of trumpets. And this is future. Now this blowing of the horn, that sound is literally going to happen on the day of trumpets in the future, and this horn being sounded signals that there's a new king who has been coronated, and he is about to make his procession from heaven to the earth. So the trumpet is sounded to announce that the king of kings is coming to the earth. That's the first thing. Also, this blowing of the trumpets signifies that there will be a resurrection from the dead of the first fruits. All of those who have died, from Abel all the way up to who's ever died right before Yeshua returns. They died in the faith. They will be resurrected from the dead. And then all of those who are alive and who are remaining in the faith, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That is what happens when the seventh trumpet sounds. So there will be a resurrection and a transformation of the first fruits. We will ascend to heaven to be married to the Lamb. We will be resurrected and we will ascend to heaven to meet the Lord in the air. And then what's going to happen, a third thing that this trumpet sound signals is that there will be a war. There will be a war. After we are married to our husband, Yeshua, we come to this earth with him, and we make war with him and the angels against all of those who are rebelling against God. And the kingdom of God is established over all of the earth. So three things happen when the trumpet is blown. Number one, it announces that the King of Kings is coming. Number two, it announces the resurrection from the dead of the first fruits and the transformation in the twinkling of an eye to eternal life in spirit composed bodies of those who are alive and remain faithful in Christ. And then the third thing is it signals war. It signals war. So we come to this earth, we establish the kingdom of God. And of course, Yeshua is the King of Kings. He's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the first thing that's going to happen is Satan is bound, put away for a thousand years, and that starts the thousand year reign of Yeshua on this earth, the kingdom of God. That's the millennial reign of Yeshua. And then teaching will begin to occur. And this teaching will go out to Israel, physical Israelites, because this will be the time when God says, okay, I will begin to open the eyes of all Israelites who are alive. And that's going to be a wonderful, fantastic time. So here's the beautiful spiritual prophecy about the future of physical Israel. This is in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We want to read in verse 7. And then in verse 11. So Romans chapter 11 starting in verse 7. That which Israel seeks for, which is salvation, they didn't obtain it. Except for the chosen ones. Except for the chosen ones. And the rest were blinded. So we know the scripture that says many are called, but few are chosen. The calling goes out when the gospel is preached. And the gospel is the good news of what God the Father is doing through His Son, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, for all of the world. And what is He doing for all of the world? He is in the process of saving all of the world. In fact, Jesus means salvation. 
Yeshua means salvation. So what God the Father is doing through Yeshua for all of the world is bringing salvation. But there's a timeline for bringing that salvation to all of the world. And it starts in the millennium in a big way with the nation of Israel. Prior to that, physical Israelites, the majority of them, had their eyes closed. They were not chosen to receive the truth of Yeshua being the Messiah. But at this point, they will have their eyes open. All of those who survived the Great Tribulation, the Day of the Lord, the Battle of Armageddon, all of those who are alive when Yeshua returns to the earth to establish the Kingdom of God, they will, for the first time, have their eyes open and have an opportunity to see Yeshua as the Messiah, to see Yeshua as the Son of God. So it says, that which Israel seeks for salvation, they didn't obtain during this age, from the church period on, and even frankly prior to that, the old covenant, that didn't provide salvation for them. So that which Israel seeks for salvation, they didn't obtain, except for the chosen ones. And as we saw on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 physical Israelites who were baptized. They had their eyes open. Plus that, there were 120 physical Israelites in the upper room on the day of Pentecost that actually received the gift of speaking in tongues. That was the Holy Spirit descending on them in a special way to give them power to preach the gospel. They had the gift of preaching in tongues and they witnessed to people. So there were 120 who were there in the upper room. They received the power to preach. They preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 physical Israelites were baptized. So that makes 3,120 who received the Holy Spirit, who were true followers of Yeshua the Messiah, who had their eyes open. But after that period of time, for the next 20 years, only a few obeyed. Only a few believed and obeyed. Again, it might have been 30, 40,000, but out of 5, 6, 7, 8 million, however many Israelites there were at the time, that's still very few. So many are called, but few are chosen. The calling is, come, get to know Yeshua. That goes out to many, many people. But only a few are chosen by our Father to have their eyes open. The rest were blinded, and we covered it in the last program. They were blinded, and it allowed the Gentiles to have their eyes open. But even with the Gentiles, it's only a small portion of the population because God's going to do a marvelous work for Gentiles as well, also starting in the blood. So the rest were blinded, but then the question in verse 11, did the rest stumble, those who were blinded, did the rest stumble that they might fall? In other words, did they fall where they couldn't get back up? Not getting back up means there's no hope for them. Did they stumble and therefore there's no hope for them? No, that is not the case. Here's the answer. May it never be. May it never be even a thought in people's minds that God is finished with Israel. That all those people who did not have their eyes open and therefore couldn't even see that Yeshua was the Messiah. Those people are not condemned to eternal death. Now because we all sin, and sin is the transgression of God's law, it's the transgression of the Ten Commandments. It means we go outside, we don't obey the Ten Commandments. So the wages of sin is death. All have sinned, so all have to die the first death. But they don't have to die the second death. We all die, this physical body returns to the dust from which we came. But that's not the end of the story. We will be, those people who did not have their first opportunity, will be resurrected to physical life and given their first opportunity. And we'll talk about that more in our next program. So these people have not fallen that they can't get up, that there's no hope. They're not lost. They have not been judged because God had not chosen to open up their eyes. So therefore, their non-acceptance of Yeshua is not truly a rejection in terms of 
the unpardonable sin. God will pardon the sin as long as people repent, but people can't repent until the Father opens up their eyes to see who Yeshua is. And then they say, truly, oh my God, I did not realize that Yeshua is the Son of God and that we need to obey Him, believe who He is, and obey Him. So, may it never be. But this is why our Father, in His divine wisdom, designed this timeline by which people will be called, will be chosen. But by their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? To provoke Israel to jealousy. To provoke Israel to jealousy. Again, if you are given something, we can think about a child that might be given a toy uh, for their birthday, for instance. You're given a toy for their birthday, they use it a couple of times, and then they discard it, they don't really want to use it anymore, and then some other child comes along and starts playing with it, and what happens with that child, the child who got it at first? Oh, now all of a sudden, it's a cool toy, oh, give me my toy. Well, that's what God is doing with Israel. It's like, I gave you this beautiful toy. You discarded it. Now I'm letting the Gentiles use this toy. And then the Israelites look at that, and all of a sudden that toy is cool. Oh, let me go and play with that toy. Now, this, of course, is a much more serious thing. Yeshua is not a toy. That was just an example to teach us this principle of what God is doing. He says, right here in the scripture, the reason why I allow them to stumble, not where they fall and they can't get up, so there's still hope for them, but temporarily I have allowed them to fall, their eyes to be blinded, for them to stumble, so that salvation would come to the Gentiles, to provoke Israel to jealousy. The Israelites, when they have their eyes open, will say, oh my God, I did not realize how valuable this person that we had read about from Moses on through the prophets and the Psalms, all of the scriptures concerning him, even the New Testament, which we never consider to be a part of the Bible, a part of your divine revelation. Now we see what you were talking about. And now, because we are convicted that we were wrong, we repent. And we accept Yeshua as the Son of God. We accept Him as our Savior, as our Lord. And we now will obey Him. We will keep your commandments in the letter and spirit of the law. Not in a self-righteous way, but in a humble, loving way. Because that's what the law is about. When you do it the right way from love, it's about a relationship. It's not about religion. It's not about legalism. It's about love. When it's done from the heart and from the mind. And that's where... Our Father wants all of us to be, and that's where He's going to get physical Israelites to be when He opens their minds, and that's going to happen on a future day of trumpets. And that's what this is talking about. That's why He did it, allowing them to stumble, to provoke Israel to jealousy. So obviously, that response is what He wants, and He wants a further response of obedience. Because belief is one thing, but obedience is another thing. And that completes the process. We have to first believe, secondarily we have to obey, and that completes the process. So continuing in Romans 11 verse 25, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of this mystery, now this is talking to Gentiles, and this is Paul speaking, I don't want you Gentiles to be ignorant of this mystery so that you won't be wise in your own conceits. And what we do here sometimes I hope it's none of us in here, but what we do here sometimes is people saying, oh, those, you know, rebellious Jews, those stiff-necked Jews, they had Yeshua right before them. They did miracles. He healed people. He even raised Lazarus from the dead. So how could they not obey him? And look at us. We have the intelligence. We have the wisdom. We have the character to follow him. No, no, no. That is not the way it goes. Our eyes, as Gentiles, were also closed at one point. We also were children of disobedience. Our father was Satan the devil because he has deceived the whole world, as it says in Revelation 12, 
verse 9. So we were deceived at one point until God opened up our minds. So don't look down upon them for not having their eyes open because they can't do it on their own just like we couldn't do it on our own. It took God deciding to choose us. So be humble, be thankful that we've been chosen to know the truth, but also be humble and understand that other people will have their opportunity. So don't go that we have salvation now. We didn't gain it on our own. We didn't gain it because we're righteous, because we're smart. We didn't gain it because we're rich, because we have some kind of connections. We gained it because God, in his divine providence, said, I am now going to draw you to my son so you can see that he is indeed the son of God, the only way to salvation. I'm going to open up your eyes to see that he is the Messiah. So they also will have their eyes open to see that he is the Messiah. So it says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of this mystery so that you won't be wise in your own conceits. Therefore, understand this. Understand this very important principle. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Because not all Israelites have had their eyes closed. Some have had their eyes open. Even today, you see Jews for Jesus. You hear about Messianic Jews. So therefore, a partial hardening has happened to Israel. And how long? For how long? Until after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Until after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So therefore, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then after that, God is going to open up the eyes of the Israelites. When will that be? That will be on a future day of trumpets. So let's continue to investigate this beautiful truth in Scripture. This now is in Romans chapter 11 and verses 26 through 27. Romans chapter 11 and verses 26 through 27. So afterwards, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, afterwards, all Israel will be saved. How wonderful, how marvelous is this great prophecy, this great revelation of truth. God has not discarded the Jewish people, the Israelites. God has not done that. He's not finished with them. There's no such thing as a replacement theology. God has not replaced physical Israelites with the church. God has temporarily set them aside, dealing with the church, which is comprised mainly of physical Gentiles. But he says, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and that happens when Yeshua returns to the earth, that's the fullness of the Gentiles, the full number, of Gentiles he wants to come in up to that point. After that, then all Israel will be saved. Hallelujah! That all Israelites will be saved at that time, beginning with those who are alive, who survived the Great Tribulation, the Day of the Lord, the Battle of Armageddon, all those physical people who survived that and who are alive when Yeshua returns, all those who aren't destroyed when Yeshua returns, when he battles against those who are rebellious. So all of those who are alive, it might be a thousand people, it could be a hundred thousand people, it could be a million people. We don't know that number, but all of those who cross over from Satan's rule, 6,000 years of Satan's rule, into the 7,000th year, which is the thousand year reign of Yeshua. And remember, that's what the seven day week is about. God in his divine design also put seven days of the week in our pattern. Every society in the world has a seven day week. Why? Why did God establish that? To teach us the lesson about the 7,000 years. The 7,000 years of him working to bring salvation to people. Each day is like a thousand years. So for six days, the scripture says people should work. And then in the seventh day, people rest. So if each day is like a thousand years, the six days represent 6,000 years of people working under 
Satan the devil, who is the god of this world. But then the seventh day of the week, which is the Sabbath, and we're commanded to rest on the Sabbath and to congregate with brothers and sisters in the faith on the Sabbath, and of course with our Lord and Savior, the Messiah Yeshua, and with our Father. So when we do that on the Sabbath, it's picturing the seventh thousandth year, this millennial reign of Yeshua, when he brings rest to all of the world from all of our frustrations, from all of our foibles, from all of our destructiveness that ultimately leads to death, and he's going to bring a way of life that brings about abundant and eternal life. We will rest from our vain labors, we will rest in Yeshua, he is our rest, and we will be taught, we will congregate together throughout the entire millennium, and we will be taught God's way of life. Now, of course, those of us who have either died in the faith or transformed in the twinkling of an eye when Yeshua returns, will also be teachers. We right now are in training as a kingdom of priests for our future role to be priests to all of the nations on the earth. And that's a wonderful privilege. So there is no such thing as replacement theology. God has just temporarily blinded the Israelites to provoke them to jealousy by opening the eyes of Gentiles. And in both cases, there are some Israelites who had their eyes open, but it's only a few. Likewise, even though it's the time of the Gentiles, there will be a full number who comes in. There's only a few Gentiles who believe the truth as well. So here, though, is the start of a major group of people. When Yeshua returns, that's the start of a major group of people, a major number of people. For the first time, there will be, again, perhaps millions that grows into billions of people who are taught the truth, who come to believe the truth, and who come to obey the truth. And it starts with Israel. Just like the gospel was preached in 30, well, from 26 to 30 AD, the three and a half years ministry of Yeshua, and then for 20 more years after that, it was preached exclusively to Israelites. So first it went to Israel, then to Gentiles. The same thing is going to happen in the millennium. First it goes to Israel, then it goes to Gentiles. So this is the starting point of God opening up the eyes of all Israelites who are alive at that time. A beautiful, wonderful truth. So continue on. Even as it is written, there will come out of Zion the Deliverer. And many people are familiar with this term, Zion. Zion is a spiritual place. It's a real place, but it's also a spiritual place. So it says, there will come out of Zion the Deliverer. That is speaking of Yeshua. And he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now it's interesting that the word Jacob is used here because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. But what does Jacob mean? The name Jacob means supplanter. Someone who grabs somebody else's ankle to trip them up. So that's a carnal mind tripping them up so they can get what they want. But his name was changed to Israel, which means one who prevails with God. Not prevailing on their own strength, but prevailing by the strength of God. So that's a conversion. So he's talking about, I'm going to turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I'm going to convert them from their Jacob mentality of trying to do things on their own, by their own power. And I'm going to show them that they need to receive my power, the power of the Holy Spirit that allows Yeshua to live in us, that allows them to have the law not written on two tables of stone, but on the two tables of their heart and their mind, where it's not external, where they can't digest it and it become a part of them, to the point where it is internal, it is digestible, it's a part of them, so they go from human nature to divine nature. So he even described the new covenant this way. Now it's quite interesting that you'll find in the Catholic Church, in the Protestant churches, you know, evangelical churches, all the flavors, of course all the cults, they will tell you that the law has been done away with. Oh, that law, the Ten Commandments, it was nailed to the cross. 
That was not nailed to the cross. What was nailed to the cross were our sins. That's what was nailed to the cross is our sins. And as well as obviously literally Yeshua being nailed to the cross. But him being nailed to the cross with the shedding of his blood, with his death, that symbolized our sins being nailed to the cross and wiped away because he took upon himself our sins. He became our sin offering. That's what was nailed to the cross. All of our guilt, all of our shame, all of our sins, that death penalty, that was nailed to the cross, and therefore we are free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Now we are free to love. And what is the definition of love? The keeping of God's commandments in the letter and spirit of the truth. So notice how the new covenant is defined, how the new covenant is described. Totally opposite from what you hear in the Catholic Church and Protestant churches and so-called Christian groups that are truly cults because they describe it this way because their eyes are blind. They've been deceived. Now that's not to put them down to say that they're evil people, to say that they're dumb people. It's just to say that they believe in dumb stuff because there's a deceiver, the devil, who's convinced them to believe this dumb stuff. But when we look at the scripture, if God is opening up your eyes, you're going to see that those teachings are dumb. They're deceptions. You're going to see the truth of how God describes the new covenant, which all of these traditional so-called Christian organizations believe that we're under the new covenant. Look at how it describes the new covenant. So verse 27, it says, this is my, and I insert the word new because that's proper and we'll see that. So this is my new covenant that I will make with them when I take away their sins. When I take away their sins. So keep that in mind. So I added the word new, and people will say, oh, you're not supposed to add anything to it. Well, I'm adding this word to give clarity, to give understanding, because as we're going to turn to, in just a second, in the book of Hebrews, it calls it the new covenant. And you'll see it has the same description, when I take away their sins, okay? So this is my new covenant. That's what he was talking about. This is my new covenant with them that I will take away their sins. This is my new covenant with them that I will take away their sins. Alright, so let's go on. I see that I have an error here where it says this is my new covenant and it should be that I will make with them when I take away their sins. So forgive me for that typographical error. But let's continue. So it says here in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 through 8 in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, Yeshua has obtained a more excellent ministry than that of the Levites. That's what he was talking about, the context. So Yeshua has obtained a more excellent ministry than that of the Levites, insofar as he is the mediator of a better covenant, because it was established upon, upon better promises. And the better promises our salvation and transformation. So he's saying he's the mediator of a better covenant. So he's referring to the old covenant and the mediator of that old covenant was Moses. But Yeshua is the mediator of a better covenant and this is called the new covenant. So you have the old covenant mediated by Moses, you have the new covenant mediated by Yeshua. So we have to ask ourselves a question. Was there a problem with the Old Covenant? The answer, as we're going to find out in Scripture, no, it was not a problem with the way that God structured the Old Covenant. The problem was with the people not having the heart and the mind to obey the Old Covenant. That's what the problem was. And we're going to see that there's a solution to that. So the Old Covenant had promises of, I'm going to make you a great nation, you're going to have plenty of children, you're not going to get sick, your land is going to be very productive like milk and honey, you're going to be prosperous, you're going to be the lead nation. That's all great, but all of that is physical. God even said, I'm going to give you spiritual education 
that's going to govern your finances, that's going to govern your politics, so to speak, that's going to govern every part of your life. I'm going to be with you. But none of that mattered. Even God being with Israel did not matter because God was not in Israel. God was with them, but it was an external kind of relationship that was typified by the Ten Commandments being written on two tables of stone outside of people that they couldn't eat and digest. But what God has always wanted is to be in us. And now he writes his laws in us, in our hearts and in our minds. So again, the better promises, because we accept Yeshua by faith, is now we have salvation. And salvation has three parts. The forgiveness of sins, the imputation of righteousness, and the down payment and guarantee of eternal life. As long as we continue and we don't reject that, we're going to have eternal life. So it's the forgiveness of sins, the imputation of righteousness, the down payment, which is the Holy Spirit in us, and the guarantee of eternal life. Because that which our Father has begun, He will complete it to the end. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. Nobody can snatch us out of the hands of Yeshua. So as long as we remain faithful, we don't throw it away, we will have salvation. So that's what salvation is. But now transformation is something else. Transformation is one thing. That is through the power of the Holy Spirit that allows Yeshua to live in us. He is writing his laws in our hearts and in our minds. So that's why it's better promises. Because we can be transformed into loving people. Where we love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And we love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what's going to produce this utopian society that everybody wants. Because everybody will be operating in pure love. So verse 7, if that first or old covenant had been faultless, there would not have been reason to establish a second. But notice what the fault was. But finding fault with the people, not with the laws, but with the people. So when you hear somebody saying, oh, that old rugged law was nailed to the cross. That, was, that law was burdensome. They're speaking that. Because their father, Satan the devil, has deceived them into thinking that. Now again, that's not saying that they're possessed with a devil, that they're demonic. It just means that they're deceived. Their eyes have not been opened, but that's not to criticize them because God is the one who has to open their eyes. No one can come to Yeshua unless the father draws them. The father sends out a message to many, but only chooses a few during this first 6,000 years. But in the millennium, he's going to start in a big way to open up people's eyes. And then what we're going to see in our next program is this beautiful truth that all people who have lived and died and their eyes have been blinded, they will be resurrected to physical life and given their first chance to have their eyes open. That's going to include Gentiles. That's going to include Israelites. So that's everybody. So we're going to see this. And that's a beautiful truth, but let's continue with this beautiful truth. So, but finding fault with the people, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Continue on in verse 9 through 10, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 9 through 10. So this new covenant will not be like the old covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they didn't remain in my covenant. Therefore, I divorced them, says Yahweh. Israel walked away from God, so God gave them a bill of divorcement. Verse 10, for this is the new covenant. Notice how it's described. This is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The house of Israel are the ten tribes that departed, that split from Israel, their leader was Jeroboam. And then the house of Judah are the ones that remained in the southern part. The house of Israel went, were a part of the northern part of Israel, the whole land of Israel. So you had ten tribes in the northern part. Their capital was Samaria. They were led by Jeroboam. 
And they were really led into idolatry first, and so they went into captivity first under Sennacherib, an Assyrian. But the house of Judah, they were the three tribes, and those three tribes were Judah, Levi, and Benjamin. So those three tribes. That comprised the southern house of Judah, and they were headquartered in Jerusalem. So that's what it's talking about, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So this is the covenant that I will make with both of those houses that were split. And by the way, Judah was led by Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So I will make a covenant, a new covenant, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah after those days. What days? After the times of the Gentiles. After God has allowed 6,000 years of humanity to be under the influence of the deceiver, Satan the devil, who is called the God of this world. So after those days, after that time is up, and when I usher in the millennium, that's when he's going to make the new covenant with physical Israelites in mass. And notice what he's going to do when he makes this new covenant. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write my laws in their hearts. That is how God describes the new covenant. I will write my laws in their minds and in their hearts. Not on two tables of stone, but now on the two tables of the mind and the heart. And you can read other scriptures to see, again, exactly what laws he's talking about. It's referring to the Ten Commandments in the letter and spirit of the law. I will be their Elohim, and they will be my people. Now notice again this tie-in about sins, and this is referring back to Romans chapter 11, where I said I added that word, new covenant, and that's because this is how he describes the new covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to read verse 12, and then we'll go back to verse 11. I will be merciful regarding their unrighteousness and their sins I will remember no more. The same exact thing we saw in Romans 11 a few moments ago. I will be merciful regarding their unrighteousness and their sins I will remember no more. Because he's going to wipe away their sins, not like just by fiat, it's because of faith. They will finally have faith that Yeshua is the Lamb of God that was slain for the foundation of the world. He is the true Passover. So all of those lambs that they killed on Passover, that pointed to Yeshua, the Lamb of God. And they will have their minds opened up to understand that. And they will finally, by faith, receive that wonderful truth. And so therefore their sins will be forgiven. No more will they have to teach their neighbor saying, No Yahweh. Why? Because all will know and obey me from the least of them to the greatest of them. A beautiful, wonderful truth. People aren't going to have to run around and say, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Please know the Lord. Why? Because everyone will be taught about the Lord. Everyone will be taught about the Lord. Other scriptures talk about the fact that the knowledge of God will cover the earth just like the waters cover the seas, the oceans, the rivers, the streams, the lakes. That's how widespread the Word of God will be. Why? Because there's only going to be one kingdom. There's only going to be one king. And everybody on the earth will be subject to that king and to the king's laws. So nobody's going to have to say, know him and obey him because people will know him and will begin to obey him. And this starts with Israel and then we'll continue with Gentiles. So, in conclusion, all physical Israelites, all physical Israelites will have their eyes open in the millennium. All physical Israelites will have their eyes open in the millennium. And all of them means all who cross over from the 6,000 years of Satan's rule into the 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, as the one who they know and value as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So this is the gospel that we need to preach and to stay motivated when preaching the gospel. We must realize that God the Father 
is the one who takes the initiative to open up people's eyes to see him and his son as God, as Elohim, and to see his son, Yeshua, as our salvation, as our Messiah, the one anointed to bring us salvation. And as we are seeing, to open eyes means to believe and obey. It's not just enough to believe, but people have to believe and obey. And our memorization scripture is what? John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me, Yeshua speaking. No one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws them. The Father has to take the initiative. It's our job to teach it's our Father's job to reach all of the ones that He wants to have their eyes open. He does it according to a divine timeline. And in our next program, we're going to see some wonderful, beautiful truths about all the people who have ever lived and died who have not had their eyes open. We're going to see what happens to them. So please tune in to our next program. Thank you for watching this program. Please tune in to our next program which is all people previously blind.